Hello and welcome everyone to DigiTales, episode 49. My name is Fezan Sayed, founder and CEO of East River. And today I have someone extremely distinguished to join us, a diplomat who has served in Pakistan for three years. He is the British Deputy High Commission for Karachi, the Director for Trade and Investment, Mike Nithivaranikis. Did I say it right? I'll give you six out of ten, Fazan. <laughs> I bet that is the one last name that no one got right in your three years here. Is that true? Very few, very few people. So how are you doing, Mike? How's today? I'm extremely well. I'm a bit tired because I'm in the midst of farewells, but I'm yes. very happy speaking to you. You're almost done with three years. You're the longest serving or one of the longest serving British diplomats in this country that the country's ever seen. And I quote one of your friends saying, he is the best diplomat we have seen in a very long time. You know, your, your journey in Pakistan and the fact that you've made such good friends and left such a mark, what kept you here for so long? I think there are several reasons. I mean, firstly, everybody knows that Karachi is an incredibly hospitable city, but frankly, the work has to be professionally stimulating and interesting and varied. And I I can't think, I mean, I'm a career diplomat, I've done seven different postings. I can't think of a place where my working week is more varied and interesting than in, and than it has been in Pakistan. And I think that was the thing that has made me feel motivated again and again. Obviously, the COVID situation led to some ups and downs, but I have thoroughly enjoyed my time here professionally and personally. And you have to, you have to not just be motivated professionally, you have to enjoy the place personally. And I think that's the thing that has kept me here. And frankly, I would stay longer, but I've, I've, run, I've run my course. And so it's time for me to move on. And you're saying that you had a more varied experience here then, and you've spent time in Afghanistan. Is that right? Correct. I would be surprised to say that Afghanistan would have had probably the most varied experience. How is Karachi giving you such variety relative no, to just, a place I mean, like Afghanistan? Yeah, so I mean, Afghanistan was very interesting, but it was quite difficult because of the security profile there. So you were in the green zone in the middle of Kabul more than you wanted to be. Of course, you know, diplomats kind of bread and butter is getting out and about and connecting with people. And that was a bit of a frustration. You're meeting lots of important people in Afghanistan, but from the confines of the British Embassy or a heavily secured and fortified building. Whereas, I mean, I think one of the main reflections on three years in Pakistan is just how safe this city has become. I'm not suggesting one should be complacent, but we all know mm -hmm. the bad old days in this city. And I think that is um, that is a huge credit to the, the people of the city, the security agencies, that is now such an easy place to move around and get access to. Uh, and and that's, made, that's enabled me to visit, not to worry about visiting hospitals, universities, businesses, other parts of the city, and indeed outside of the city into Sindh. Uh, I think that's what's allowed me to learn and absorb a lot. And didn't your security detail get worried? I mean, you're probably one of the most traveled or, or versatile diplomats in town because you're always around. Yeah. Versus if you look at some of the, the other diplomats from Western countries, especially the US, they're very restricted in their movement. This kind of movement or the access that you were able to get, what did that do for you? I mean, it's allowed me to see more of the of the city than I otherwise would have. I think that could only happen because the wider security environment has allowed that. Um, I mean, we obviously move incrementally and slowly in some of the places that we're allowed to visit. We used to have a very short list of places where we could go spontaneously at very short notice. That has expanded all the time. And, you know, for example, I've got colleagues here who play golf now. Um, we've had people visit Liari, which would not have been possible before. I think the only time my security wow. detail got really concerned was when you actually, Mr. Syed, invited me to Burns Road. And that's what needed a very specific <laughs> kind of um, security approach. But, but, but we managed it and we achieved it. And I hope that my successors will be able to, to do that. Now, I think you were probably one of the few diplomats that actually made it out, not just to Burns Road, but actually sat out in the open and experienced all that Karachi had to offer. And you didn't just do it once. You said, let's do it again. And we went to the other part of town and we went to Bahadrabad and we ate at Alamgir Road. 
What did you think of the food here? The food is completely different from what you're used to in other parts, and the entire experience roadside dining here is very, very different. No, not, not at all. I mean, I was not at all concerned. It was so atmospheric and vibrant. And of course, we did most of these during Ramzan. So it's, you know, there's already a kind of right. celebrating feel to, to, to it. But I mean, I, I think Desi food is the best food in the world. But remember, I've lived in other parts of South Asia. My first posting was Malaysia, where there's an incredibly um, uh, eclectic mix of, of foods. And I, I love eating out. Um, uh, so Burns Road, the, the Bora Muslim community area, Zamir Ansari's on Alamgir Road. These were all fantastic experiences. Um, and the one we failed to get to was the fish market in Kimari, because I really like yes. fish. So uh, that has to be on the agenda for my next visit. Absolutely will be. And that's something that you cannot miss. I think that's probably one of the oldest fish markets. Uh, and that's native to Karachi from even, I think, pre-partition times. And it's definitely worth visiting. You know, I want to ask you one other thing. You know, there's been a lot that has happened in Pakistan in the last three years. The country's really especially now there's so much uncertainty political economic and so on tell me what how have you or how do you define the progress the country's made over the last three years that you've been here so i would think i would point to a couple of areas i mean firstly one is a tricky one because i think it is that there is still a perception internationally of pakistan that i think is mistaken i'm not suggesting there aren't things in your country that you want to change, just like there are things in the UK I would like to see change. Um, and I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting that everything people have a view about in Pakistan is incorrect. But for example, I mean, the welcoming nature of this country, the philanthropy that exists here, the beauty of the landscape, not just in this part of uh, Pakistan, but in the north, which I was lucky enough to visit a couple of weeks ago, the ability of cricket teams now to return to the country because they are able, feel, they feel secure in doing so. The strength of the Pakistan Pakistan Super League, the brilliance of Pakistan's uh, pavilion at Expo, some of the kind of um, star individuals that are uh, doing amazing things here and internationally. I just feel that Pakistan deserves a slightly better story internationally. And that's something that it's incumbent on all of us who are able to travel need to do because my one of my biggest frustrations is that there are a number of, I, I need to bring more British companies to Pakistan. I've had some successes, but mm -hmm. several failures. And that's partly because they may have this outdated perception or they're, un, you know, they're unaware of the change that has happened in the country. And I don't, um, I don't try and twist the arms of people, but I say to them, if you are visiting other parts of South Asia or the Middle East or the Gulf or doing business in Indonesia or Turkey, why would you miss out a country of 220 million people that's growing to 400 million people mid-century that has a large middle class, mm -hmm. speaks the English language, has a huge UK diaspora, you know, will be familiar to you in terms of the historical context and legal situation. And so I think there are just a lot of fundamental areas that make this an area that is, make this a country that is worth exploring, notwithstanding the obvious immediate political uncertainty, economic instability. If you look, you always look to Pakistan in the medium and long term. And so this has to be on everybody's radar screen. And it's, it's, you know, it's important that I now try and help get more individuals, companies, organizations to see Pakistan as an opportunity, not a risk. You mentioned that you had success and failures. Walk me through one of these successes, because I think what you can share and shed light on as you successfully were able to bring someone into Pakistan, we can learn what you did that worked, and maybe we can do that on a larger scale. I mean, from, in terms of putting Pakistan on the international map, I think the return in 2019 of British Airways, after a hiatus of 10 years, and then the addition of Virgin Atlantic, I know not to Karachi, but to Lahore and Islamabad, that's largely linked to, that's the UK diaspora links are with Punjab and Azad Kashmir, rather than mm -hmm. the family links that exist with Karachi. But Virgin Atlantic came to Pakistan, it was the only new country they ventured into during COVID because they saw an opportunity. And it might surprise people to hear that their most popular route was not um, London Heathrow to Lahore, London Heathrow to Islamabad. It was Manchester to Islamabad because there are so many British Pakistanis in Yorkshire and in the northwest right. of England. And I think, you know, that allowed people to see. I know COVID was difficult for travel and lockdowns, 
But I think one of the few upsides of COVID was that Pakistanis and the diaspora saw how beautiful their own country was. They visited North Pakistan. People have not been to uh, Chitral Gilgit and realized that the, the potential that exists. And so I'm happy that we've managed to bring many more British nationals to Pakistan to see what the country has to offer. And, and that was not straightforward because obviously we have to go through a bilateral process in, in um, developing those aviation links. And I hope that those will expand uh, over time. And so the fact that you're able to bring an airline in, one of the biggest airline for Britain to the country, you're able to convince them to start their routes again. How do you think this would play out for, let's say, other airlines or for the marketing or the image of Pakistan over the next few years? Are they are they comfortable with their route? Are they successful? I mean, you're mentioning that their one route works really well, but do you see them expanding into the country or is it just that one route that they're going to stick to? No, I mean, I, th I think the irrespective of what British Airways or Virgin Atlantic do in the future, because they will always have much wider commercial um, considerations to take into account, particularly as we go through this um, um, COVID period of new schedules opening up, and it's always about you know, profitability of routes, ease of routes. I still think that Pakistan, as long as the security situation stays stable, that medium term, you'll find new airlines taking an opportunistic view. I mean, look at airlines like Serene and Air Sial that have opened up and are looking mm -hmm. to venture beyond Pakistan. I think that's the same for other airlines that are operating elsewhere in the region. There's also those charter possibilities where you might occasionally see groups of, of um, individuals say, well, we're going out to Pakistan um, mostly in the winter, when it's winter in the UK for weddings and family visits. Let's charter a flight from Leeds or Bradford or Manchester or Birmingham. And so I still think that if there is an openness to accepting that and we can work through the system quickly, you'll see new names being added and new opportunities arising. You also mentioned on the failure side, I mean, this is a great win, but you also experienced some failure in maybe bringing in business, maybe the objectives that were set for you in terms of uh, attracting trade and investment. Walk me through one of those failures and sort of what you learned from that and how we might be able to learn here and apply uh, some of those learnings. So I think one, one disappointment and then one sort of untapped potential, I would say, one disappointment is that um, one of our biggest sectors where I think the UK and Pakistan could um, join forces in a much bigger way is in the healthcare sector. And I still believe that that is one that will, in the coming years, show incredible value because it's a public service that is under huge pressure in both our countries and elsewhere around the world. And I think some of the things that exist in Pakistan in the ability to deliver reasonable quality healthcare at, at low cost is something that a high cost economy like the UK can't compete with. But where the UK can bring something to the table is in knowledge transfer, continuing professional development, the ability to train doctors and nurses to a high level and, and to produce good quality outcomes. And so we had one healthcare institution that we were hoping to bring to Karachi, which has not materialized. I still think it might materialize, but it may start in Lahore now. And so that was a disappointment because I had hoped that we would sign that while I was here and that we would really build momentum because that was going to be a very large super specialty hospital that I think would have competed with the very best in the country and would have raised the standards of all of those institutions, whether it's Shaukat Khanum, Aga Khan, Ziaudin, South City, whatever it might be. And so I'm, I'm sad that we've not been able to do that. I mean, my reflection is that that particular um, uh, proposition got caught up in bureaucracy. And that, I think, is a reflection that I take away. This is a tough place to do business. I mean, remember, it was the British that you can blame for introducing bureaucracy to the world. But I would say that Pakistan has taken it to an altogether higher level. <laughs> and that's something that that's something that needs to be addressed because that puts off investors, it puts off businesses. If you think it's going to be too difficult to get started, they'll go, they'll go elsewhere. So that's been a, a disappointment. The, the, the untapped potential one, which is one where I know you have a huge amount of expertise, is in the IT enabled services from an export perspective, but also from the IT startup perspective in attracting venture capital funding, you know, partnerships in fintech, e-commerce, those sorts of areas. I just think in a country with a population as young as Pakistan's, with the, the demographics as strong as they are, the kind of smartphone owning youngster 
is going to require just increasingly sharper services beyond just entertainment from the confines of their of their home and, the, and, and on their phone. And I think the, the market really is ripe for change in that direction. And I just hope the UK can, can see that and can carve out some opportunity to do business with people like you and others who are the kind of entrepreneurial class that are, you know, exploiting in a good way these, these opportunities. You, you mentioned the IT services and service outsourcing. One of the biggest challenges, and you also highlighted it, is, is bureaucracy is very slow. One of the biggest challenges is across the financial aspect of transactions between a local company and a foreign company or a local company, its parent entity you know, overseas and transferring and remitting money back and forth. Have you seen examples of other countries in your in your travels um, where there was thick red tape and bureaucracy, but the country was able to overcome and navigate through that over time and make laws that allowed for better, freer moving of funds and investment? Because unless you're able to sort of move your funds back in and out of the country easily, there's never going to be growth. You need capital to grow. And if you've got clients who are paying you overseas, and the money needs to come back. I mean, that is the biggest issue in the fintech space right now. That's the biggest issue in the startup space right now. And we don't see any ease coming through because of the red tape. How yeah. do you think we can navigate through that? And is there an example that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is in the immediate term difficult because there's such a sort of short term challenge in, in dealing with the, the, the IMF program, getting some economic stability. Uh, in place and dealing with the challenges, obviously, some of them global on high inflation, cost of living, high commodity prices. But I still think that there is an opportunity from an investment point of view to genuinely turn Pakistan's investment window into a one-stop shop, whether that's at a federal level or a provincial level. Um, you know, uh, Interestingly, Sindh has been lauded for its public-private partnership system in attracting um, uh, international interest, not not from the UK, I'm sorry to say, but from elsewhere. And I think that needs to be built on to, to show that there is there is, is a successful model out there. But a one-stop shop has to actually be a one-stop shop because the difficulties people face in Pakistan is if they go to see a ministry, inevitably they are well-received, they're dealt with at a senior level, they usually meet people who are knowledgeable about their topics and who say all of the right things the difficulty comes when that ministry has to then negotiate with another part of the Pakistan system, provincially or federally. And that's difficult then for the investor, the company or the, the joint venture to start to navigate the system. They need somebody on the inside to help them do that, to make sure that they are, you know, their investment is placed quickly, not just the warm welcome to bring them in in the first place. And I think that's something that Pakistan could probably learn from other countries, not just in the region, but internationally, who have worked out how to how to nail that sort of investment um, attractive potential, but to show the kind of delivery mechanism around it. I think there is going to be a there is for the foreseeable future going to be a challenge around, you know, just the foreign currency pressure, you know, depreciating rupee and and people bringing foreign currency in, and then if they're remitting profits, how do they do that? But I have found, I must say personally, dealing with the State Bank of Pakistan to be to have been a really enjoyable part of my role. I mean, when I go and lobby on the behalf of a British company or when I go and talk to them about a particular issue, for example, the renewable energy space where we've got some significant equities in wind power corridors in Garo and Jimpia with a lot of UK taxpayers' money invested in debt and equity in those projects. You know, they've always been uh, accessible. They've always listened and they have tried their very best to find a, 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 an equitable solution to the problem. And I think that's a space where those institutions, whether it's the, the Board of Investment, uh, whether it's the State Bank of Pakistan, whether it's a reformed Federal Board of Revenue, you know, whether it's the Ministry of Finance coming up with new legislation, there is, a, there is an approach that can be taken, but it does need an all of government kind of um, uh, agreement that they are going to push in the same direction. And did you interact with the Board of Investment? Because I kept thinking the Board of Investment, that's probably the role that you're defining is the role that they should be playing? Yeah, I mean that they are um, they are extremely. I mean, I've dealt now with I think three chairmen of the board of investment and uh, and a couple of federal secretaries, 
and they are, I mean, clearly with the, the, the scale of Chinese investment in Pakistan, they are very focused on, on, on CPEC and a lot of the kind of um, uh, Chinese companies that are operating in Pakistan. But I still think that um, the ability for Pakistan to go to the Gulf, North America, Europe and other parts of the Far East to say, we are open for business and we're not just open for business because we want you to come and see what a beautiful country we've got, but we want you to come and profit is not a dirty word. We want mm -hmm. you to come here to see that this is a sustainable business that will be very good for us and very good for you. I think that needs to happen more and not just be not just be a kind of standard roadshow where you pitch up in a city and get a group of people together and you know show a jazzy video. I think it has to have actions follow warm words. So it is walking the talk. I'm not claiming that Pakistan doesn't do that. The COVID period has been tricky for that. But but if we look ahead to 2023, hopefully if there is some stability in, in the global economy, then that is the time to start to, I think, um, to, to push the, the, the potential of the country in that way and then to follow it up and, and really deliver on some of those projects. And then you produce those case studies. I mean, I actually mentioned it's maybe good to just come back to renewable energy. We're all going to have to find new sources of energy we all know the solar potential in, in Pakistan. We have an organization called British International Investment. It used to be called the Commonwealth Development Corporation. They have something like 330 million US dollars invested in Pakistan now. They want to put another $500 million into the country in the next five years. They describe Pakistan as one of their powerhouse markets. And I agree with them. And it's not just in renewables, it's in other areas of infrastructure, healthcare, education, um, uh, professional services and e-commerce. But their issue is they need to find the projects and the partners where they can safely put an investment in. They're not like a traditional PE fund trying to get out after three or four years. They've got a slightly longer investment um, window timescale. But that, that's an example, I think, of where if uh, uh, project promoters and uh, government could come together with international investors, the potential in Pakistan is, is really significant. But let me counter that by saying that Fair enough. Infrastructure development, energy, healthcare, even education, completely understood. And you can take a long term play on the population and so on. Counter argument is your GDP is north of around, let's say, 280 billion. Your GDP per capita, you're looking at about $1,400 per person. The ability to consume of this population is low. There's of 220 million people, there's only, I'd say, 80 or 90 million that have a 3G or 4G data connection on their phone. And of that, there's only 40 million people who are daily active users of the internet. So that's far lower than the 220 million everyone quotes. So yeah. my question being, yes, and it's a very young population. 60% is, let's say, under the age of 25. So my question is, young population, there isn't a lot of ability to consume for the mass population, right? 220 is not the right number to look at. 40 million is because of the 40 million, if they're daily active users of the internet, maybe they have some money left over for consumption. So beyond infrastructure, beyond education and healthcare, why would anyone come into this country? There is no ability to consume. I, well, I mean, I, I, those are fair points, absolutely fair points. We all know that in a country of 220 million people, there are a large number who are at or below the poverty line. And, and unfortunately, we're in a, an environment globally at the moment where that figure is going to come under pressure and, and, and likely increase. And, you know, look at girls' education, the way it was impacted by COVID. Getting girls into school is tough in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Once they've left school, getting them back in a second time is even harder. And we're finding that through our partnerships elsewhere. So I absolutely recognize this is not necessarily the place where somebody's going to come and do a billion dollar investment. But those, those numbers, those fundamentals that you talk about, they can be increased with the right economic stability. If you've got, if you've got growth that can get back to 5% and upwards, other countries in the region have shown how, num how many numbers of people can be pulled out of poverty. And, and, and education shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be kind of swept aside. If people can in, continue to invest in education at, at, at cheap private levels and better public sector levels, then we are finding that in the space of one generation, you will see young people whose parents were perhaps fishermen, rickshaw drivers, household staff, not just going to school unlike their parents, not just being literate unlike their parents, but finishing school and going into college. Now, you know, they're not going, they're not all going to Lums or IBA or Habib University, but they're going to good colleges 
where they're coming out and having walking straight into a job. It is about pushing the volume of that upwards. Uh, that, that number of 40 million that you quote to 220, that's a massive gap. I realise it's a huge challenge and it can't be achieved if the economy is under the pressure that it's in, in, in at the moment. But we all know that Pakistan has been through its ups and downs and a bit of a roller coaster. If it can just find that that stability to be able to return the GDP growth to a, a certain level that can be sustained, then you will find you will find that the consumerism goes up, the disposable income goes up, the confidence that people have to invest goes up, and the business community here, which we all know is small but successful, starts to see more opportunity domestically and and brings confidence back. And I, I know these are all big ifs, Fazan, but it but it has been done. It has been done elsewhere, and it will it will come back again. I, I, I'm confident. But, you know, and just to build on that, for that, and I agree, the 5% number you can get there and countries have done that. But for that, you need unified leadership. You need one message. In our country, unfortunately, there are five powerhouses all sort of vying for power and fighting amongst each other. The judiciary, big business, bureaucracy, establishment, and then obviously the politicians. If these five have never been on the same page and doesn't seem like they ever will be, do you really think we're ever going to hit a 5% growth number because you need a singular vision that is common and disseminated across the masses and with five of these groups constantly fighting as we can see today this is never going to happen so that's uh that's one um pessimistic uh, way of looking at it and i would i just preface my remarks by saying pakistan is not the only country where the institutions that you've just described are under some pressure or not perhaps gelling well together um, as well as they can. But, but that doesn't mean that those institutions can't get to that point and that this is perhaps a bump in the road. Maybe people would describe it as even bigger than a bump in the road. Uh, if, if you're a common man on the street and you don't have as much money um, left over to, to be able to, to spend on those nice to haves at the end of the month because you're just struggling to put food on the table, that doesn't, you know, doesn't feel fantastic, of course. And the cost of living is, is definitely increasing for large parts of the world. But I still think those are institutions that have um, strength internally within them and knowledge, of course, vested interests. And at the end of the day, when countries are pushed to the brink, it sh you know, it's, it's about the institutions that we rely on to, 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 to pull things back from the brink, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's politicians, whether it's the bureaucracy, whether it's the business community. And I have seen evidence in the past where when one looks at the medium and long term strategy, whether it's this government that's in power or its predecessors or future governments, everybody knows that Pakistan exports textiles in large amounts. And that's great. Mm -hmm. and we hope that continues. But we all know as well that Pakistan should be exporting pharma, IT enabled services, agri tech, other items that are higher end beyond basic um, surgical, surgical instruments and sports good. Let's put it, that, put, it, put it that way. So we know that the potential is there. There is the ability for these power um, interests to come together to, to develop a medium and longer term strategy to, make, to be able to make that happen. And I think the ingredients are there and eventually there will be a, a, a time when people come together better to, to do it. I would argue, I would, I would just add one other point, which is that let us look um, and reflect on the last couple of years. If people had been predicting in March 2020, would Pakistan go through COVID as well as it has done when considering other countries in the region and internationally struggled so badly? I'm not saying that Pakistan didn't struggle in that first wave because in June 2020, it was a, it was a very tight run thing in terms of full up hospitals and you know real, real services under pressure. Mm -hmm. But look at what's happened in the last two and a half years. This country has done incredibly well and that is when the system pulled together federally, provincially, they left aside whatever the politics were. The NCOC did its job. Chief ministers made local announcements. The federal government made smart lockdown announcements. The, the ability of the system to do things like polio vaccine rollout pivoted towards doing COVID vaccine rollout. And as a result, Pakistan's, I know that, you know, any death is, is, is too many, but Pakistan actually did a hell of a job. And I, again, I think that's something that they should, should be uh, proud of. But consider when they're when they're facing other pressures, there is a there is a model that might work in the future. It just feels like because of the politics and the economics at the moment, that's a distant prospect. But I I, I think it, I would take a less pessimistic um, outlook. 
And I think the fact that you mentioned the NCOC, I mean, I, I, I do want to add that, that I think in recent memory, the NCOC is a great example of these five institutions coming together and uniting around a common cause and putting aside their differences in politics. And I think that if they were able to take a similar approach on the economic and political stability front, if there were committees made for these and they got along just like they did in the NCOC, you're absolutely right. I think that we have a great shot at this. I want to switch gears and I want to talk about, you mentioned pushing yourself or pushing to the brink. You're a health buff. You're constantly pushing yourself to the brink when it comes to health and fitness. You're a big runner and you've actually enjoyed running in Karachi. You've managed to keep that hobby, that passion alive. Tell me more about how you've made this passion and actually made this one of your great achievements in your three year stint here. I want you to tell me more about that. Thank you. So I, uh, I, I've always been keen on running, but it's only in the last six or seven years that I took it up more seriously because as I stopped playing um, team sports uh, and had a few back problems, I thought running was the thing that I would enjoy the most. And I, and I did my first marathon just before coming to Karachi. And so as soon as I arrived, I thought I want to get into running. I must confess the first period, it was a bit too much treadmill running. But in the second half of my posting here, I managed to meet um, some really passionate runners. I mean, I will name two clubs, Seaview Running Club, which mm -hmm. Bilal Rafi Munir and Adnan Gandhi helped set up several years ago, and Wednesday Night Pacers, and, and there are other clubs who have done a great job of uh, profiling the, the well-being potential of running and cycling, I would say. The, and, and during COVID, people, perhaps because they were frustrated by lockdown, found a new way to, uh, to to exercise and so the kind of uh, the running spirit that exists in this city and and in Lahore and Islamabad has been a real revelation to me I've probably not done as much outdoor running with um, these clubs as I would have liked I, I, I've had an injury for a couple of months but I'm coming back from that I hope but uh, I don't know if, if your listeners are familiar with Anti Park which is very near my uh, Deputy High Commission <laughs> here it's a very nice one kilometer loop so occasionally very early in the morning I would go there with a few colleagues and, and that was fun and running along sea view towards the Amar project you know going occasionally further further afield doing the special olympics um half marathon doing the karachi commissioners marathon although it's not a marathon it's more a 10 kilometer race those have been really fun fun uh, things for me and so i felt you know that my running i could help pakistan raise its profile in running because you know we all know that pakistan is brilliant at cricket and has mm -hmm. been brilliant at Lots of other sports. I mean, look at the um, amazing escapades of its mountaineers, including its women mountaineers recently. And we all know Absolutely. about javelin throwers, judo, boxing, hockey, you know, some of them. But, but cricket sucks the oxygen out of lots of other sports in Pakistan. And so it'd be good to sure. get running profiled in a, in a bigger and better way. And so you've worked on something. I believe there's a marathon. Karachi is having its first marathon coming up soon. That's correct. So we announced, in fact, last night, and I'm really happy that you brought that up, that um, we will be running in January 2023 in Karachi, the Citizens Foundation, TCF mm -hmm. Marathon, the first ever TCF Marathon. There may actually be another marathon happening a few weeks before that, but it'll be a very different event to ours. So January the 22nd, 2023, mark your diaries, get your trainers on. Fazan Syed has committed to running that. <laughs> Um, that is right. Started, I have. And I have started training. training. Exactly. <laughs> now I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this. And so you're actually, you've taken this running spirit and you've actually converted to a marathon. The, all the big cities in the world have their flagship marathon. They have London, they have New York, they have Boston, Amsterdam. You know, why not have Karachi on the map? And in wintertime, January or December, Karachi's weather is incredible. And our coastline is is something that is completely untouched and undiscovered relative to other major cities in the world. So I'm so happy to hear that, you know, this was able to be materialized um, with your efforts and with the efforts of the TCF. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Fazan. Let me just say as well that as a stepping stone to Karachi in January, there is the London Marathon, which is in October. And um, we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to persuade the company called Abbott, which which mm -hmm. sponsors six biggest marathons in the world. So the master series of marathons is uh, London, Berlin, Tokyo, Chicago, New York, Boston. And Abbott has found five free places for us to send runners 
with the TCF umbrella to London on the 2nd of October. In, and in addition to those five runners that we announced last night, and there are two women and three men, all have got inspiring stories. They're going to be led by torture master Adnan Gandhi, who's one of your previous guests on this show, I know. That's right. And in addition to those five, we will probably have another six or seven people who have a passion for Pakistan and running. They're either British, American, Pakistani, or other people from Pakistan who go to ballot place. And so watch out for a very big TCF team at the London Marathon, um, creating some waves, which we hope will um, encourage, uh, you know, massive support in the run-up to, to Karachi a few months later. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, I hadn't quite realised before coming to Pakistan just how beautiful the weather is from sort of late November into February. And, you know, January 2023 will be the most extraordinary event. And I'm convinced and confident that it will then become a permanent fixture on the on the racing calendar and that people will see how uh, how welcoming the city is and why they want to return year after year and make the event grow and who knows we might take it we'll keep it in Karachi but we might also do it in Lahore uh, and Islamabad but instead of it being a one-off event make sure that we we build it up and build it up year after year amazing I'm, I'm very excited um, it's given me inspiration even this morning I mean I'll give you an example I was so excited by this whole marathon thing that I said, you know, I, when I decided a few weeks ago, I'm going to sign up and then Adan's been helping train. Um, I wasn't able to get to bed till about 1am last night and training means you have to be up at 530 and on the road at about 545, 6, whatever. And I was up at 530 with four and a half hours of sleep. And I'd had a very heavy seafood meal last night, I was out and I was running and the weather was amazing. And I was like, this is going to be so much fun that in Karachi, for the first time in my entire life, such an event is taking place. And I think it's it's moments like these, if we can capture the, the narrative, the media and the press correctly, I think we can really put a positive spin on the country and the things that are taking place here. Yeah, well, well done. I mean, I'm amazed because I know your fitness regime. I thought you were looking a little bit slimmer since I last saw you, but well done for committing to that. I mean, I think the, 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 that is going to be the, the challenge. The buzz you get, I think, from just a sense of achievement, whether it's a 10-minute run or a one-hour yeah. run. And I, I, I run in the UK all the time, and there's something called park run, which is only five kilometres. But even people who might be out of shape think they can't do it. When they cross the finish line, they may not even be running. They may be walking. That sense of accomplishment is absolutely enormous. And I do think there is a... I, I'm trying to do two things with this event. It is help raise the profile of running, which is one of my passions. And my other is uh, TCF, and it's to try and raise a really substantial sum of money because I have seen firsthand how brilliant they are at delivering quality education uh, here in Pakistan to, to so many uh, underprivileged kids. And so uh, I'm hoping that those two things will will um, uh, allow us to be able to, to bring more people into the kind of TCF family and the running community here in Karachi and, and further afield. And maybe you can help me get the, the TCS chairperson to tell their story on the next Digitales as, as part of that. Um, Absolutely. You know? that's, a, that's a great idea. We will certainly, certainly organize that. I want to ask you one last question. I know I've taken up too much of your time. And as we exit out of this show, you went to all the hot spots of dining in Karachi. Tell me what's your favorite food that you discovered on those roadside eateries? Well, do you know, I mean, the one, first thing I would say is that eating in people's houses in Karachi is fantastic because uh, unlike in the UK, uh, people, a lot of people here have their own cooks. They're lucky enough to have people mm -hmm. who've been with the family for decades. And so some of the food that I've eaten in people's houses has been amazing. There are some great restaurants, you know, high-end restaurants, cheaper mm -hmm. eateries. But I think the, 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 the best experience, I would say three, three dishes that were aligned to places. And I happened to be with you at all three places. So I would say when I was at um, uh, Buns Road, some of the chicken mm -hmm. dishes, including very crispy chicken, was just fantastic. I, as a person who doesn't eat much meat other than chicken i wasn't the guy to have nihari or brains or bone marrow at one point i wonder whether, <laughs> I wonder whether some of this food was coming from the local mortuary not from the restaurant but anyway but, but, but everybody else was lapping it up and the atmosphere of you know tens of thousands of people eating you know at right. midnight during ramzan is it was unforgettable uh, so I, I thoroughly enjoyed that and then when we were at the border uh, uh communities eateries 
Um, you you bought lots of nice things like chicken corn soup, and there were quite yep. famous drinks that we were having. But you introduced me to something that has been um, bad for my health, but good for my <laughs> taste buds, which was Malpura oh, sort of my pancake favorite. type, uh, pancake type uh, dish um, with rubbery, which I think you can either dip it into or pour it on. And yep. you'll remember that when I did an iftar a couple of nights later, we actually got the Malpura <laughs> kiosk I remember that. to my house. And I forced people into having uh, Malpura. So that was phenomenal. Although I dread to think how many calories was in one slice. It, and you then, could never think that they could make pancakes worse for you and they deep fry them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, the problem with you is that you know how many calories are associated with each of these. And it's not, it's not very nice <laughs> to know that before you bite into them. But anyway, and then lastly, you know, that um, Alamgir Road visit uh, where, I mean, one of them, my other reflections from Pakistan, I mentioned that I think Desi food is the best, but, you know, I'm, I have a weakness for Pakistan bread. So I love naan and roti mm. and sheer mal. But the, this restaurant did these smaller paratas where they were Alamgir so Road incredibly... paratas, yeah. Yeah, you just kind of picked them up and they crumbled in your hand. And, you know, you, yeah. don't, even need to, you don't even need to eat them with anything else or dip them in a sauce. Yeah. You can just eat them as they are absolutely tremendous i mean just incredible food it's not been good for my health i want to just mention one last thing because i wanted i didn't want this uh, interview to pass without commenting on it because i've talked about traveling to different places but i just wanted to say um, and i'm sure i'm speaking to an audience that is already familiar with this but two weeks ago i was lucky enough to go to north pakistan i was there on a very short trip and i managed to get around quite a few places in a short space of time so i flew into gilgit I went to Fairy Meadows, which is in the foothills of Nanga Parbat, the second highest mountain in Pakistan. A stunning location. I mean, literally stunning. Uh, I visited Baltic Fort in uh, Gilgit. We went to Lake Atabad. Um, we managed to see, uh, oh no, Baltic Fort in Hunza, sorry. We went to Lake Atabad, and then we finished up in Skardu. I was expecting to be impressed, but I was absolutely awe-inspired by what I saw. It was simply breathtaking and so i know that when i come back in january i'm probably not going to be able to visit these places because they'll maybe cut off and too cold but my subsequent visit after that i intend to come to to north pakistan and i think you and i should i don't know go to base camp of nanga barbat or k2 or somewhere like that or do some sort of exhibition ex, ex, expedition, <laughs> expedition. expedition. <laughs> maybe maybe maybe, it will maybe. Be an expedition. <laughs> but just to say I, if you yeah. have not been there you have absolutely got to do it because it was stunning. No, it's you're absolutely right. I've been there a few years ago and the roads are incredible. It's it's like driving in Europe. Um, you know, getting there is a little bit of a challenge. I understand sometimes the flights can be tricky and some of the roads there are not the best. But once you're there, Gilgit onwards all the way up to uh, Khunjara Pass, the Chinese border. Fantastic. It's almost like you are in an untouched part of Europe and you're seeing some of the greatest sights ever. And I'm so glad that you were able to see that. And I would love for you to tell everyone. And I think once this marathon is done, we need a new mission. And I think the base camp mission is a good mission to have. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Pa I'll be a Pakistani ambassador internationally. <laughs> That's amazing. Mike, thank you so much for taking out the time. It was always, it is always fun and great to talk to you and get your perspective on a number of things. I'm so glad you had a wonderful three years here. You were able to see and discover and meet pretty much everyone, everything, and everything that's possible. And uh, I'm so glad that you're able to go out there and put the message of Pakistan in front of different people because this is a great country with tremendous potential. We just need to tweak a few things. And 5%, I think 7% growth is very, very attainable. So look forward to staying in touch. And thank you again for the time, Mike. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This was Digitales episode 49. Stay tuned for the next one. Bye-bye.